The title of this sermon is Learning About Faith from a Prostitute. Learning about faith from a prostitute. Some of you guys, some of you guys have heard of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the transcendentalist. He said, in my walks, every man I meet is my superior in some way. And in that, I learn from him. Now, what he was saying there is that you can learn something from anybody. You can learn something from anybody, anybody or, or everyone you meet. You can learn something from pretty much anything, not just people. And we see that in the, in the Bible. In the book of Proverbs, it says that you can learn things from ants, you know, insects. Jesus, he was always pointing to, he said you can learn things from the flowers, and you can learn things from the birds, and you can learn things from seeds, and you can learn something from just about anybody. I read a book uh, when I was a kid called Twice Pardoned. And Twice Pardoned was about a man named Harold Morris. True story. And Harold Morris was serving two life sentences for murder and armed robbery. Now, he didn't pull the trigger, but he was hanging out with the wrong people. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people, serving two life sentences. One day, the prisoners are out in the yard, and a little boy from the neighborhood, 12 years old, he walks up to the fence, and he says to Harold, he said, hey, man, I'm not scared of you. And Harold said, you should come on this side of the fence and say that. And, of course, they struck up a friendship, got really close. The little boy told Harold, I love you, and I believe in you. You're not a murderer. Nobody had ever told Harold that before in his life. And so that little boy became Harold's whole life. He visited him every day. And the little boy witnessed to him. He was a strong Christian, just 12 years old, but he told Harold about Jesus. Witnessed to him, shared Christ with him, discipled him, told him how to grow in Christ. And at the same time, that little boy... Every time he came to see Harold, he had his basketball with him. And he told Harold, I want to grow up to be the greatest basketball player who ever lived. And so Harold, before he went to prison, he was an all-state basketball player. So he said, well, bring your basketball, and I'll teach you how to play. Across the fence, of course. So every day he'd bring his basketball, and Harold would teach him the fundamentals and the drills and how to play the game. Well, fast forward a few years, and that little boy grew up to be a great basketball player. His state basketball team won the state championship and he was voted the most outstanding player. He learned how to play. And then Harold Morris, he was eventually released from prison. And he became a dynamic Christian preacher and went traveling the world as an evangelist, leading many, many young people to Christ. So you have an incarcerated prisoner who learns about Jesus from a 12-year-old boy. You have a 12-year-old boy who learns how to play basketball from a prisoner, from an inmate. You can learn something from anybody. Today, we're going to learn something from a prostitute. We're going to learn about faith from a prostitute. And we're studying Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, and the author of Hebrews teaches us about faith by pointing to all these Old Testament Hebrews. Somebody call out some of the Hebrews, that, uh, some of the Hebrews, some of the heroes that, that we've studied in this series so far. Anybody? anybody? Joshua, Moses, Noah, Abraham, Enoch, who else? Abel, a lot of these great heroes to be expected. But then the author of Hebrews pulls a fast one on us. He surprises us. He says, now we're going to learn about the faith from a prostitute. And so we're in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. And it says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. Who is Rahab? Who is this prostitute that we're supposed to learn about faith from? Well, I want you to go back to Moses. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. But it was his successor, Joshua's job, to actually lead them into the promised land. And we talked about this last week. What was the first battle? The battle of what? The battle of Jericho. That was Joshua's job to lead them into the promised land and to drive out or annihilate all the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. And remember, the first battle, the battle of Jericho, I told you all about it last week, but there was something I left out. Before that battle, Joshua sent out two spies. He sent two spies to Jericho to scout it out. And so those two spies went to the city of Jericho, and they stayed at the house of a prostitute named Rahab. Now, what they were doing there, it doesn't say, but they were staying at the house of a prostitute named Rahab. Well, the king of Jericho... He gets word 
that the Hebrew spies are staying at Rahab's house. He sends his soldiers, his men to Rahab's house. They're banging on the door and they say, hey, release the men. We know they're there. Release those Israelite spies. We know they're staying with you. Turn them over. Well, Rahab comes out and look what she says in Joshua 2, verses 4 through 5. She says, well, yes, um, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. At nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out, and, and I don't know where they were going. Chase after them quickly, though, and you can catch up with them. But actually, Rahab, she had hidden the spies up on her roof. It says, among the stalks of flax. I had to look up that. What is flax? Well, flax is used to make linen. That's where we get linen from, from flax. So the soldiers, they believed Rahab, and they went, and they left, and they chased after the the Israelite spies, but Rahab, then she went up to the roof and she talked to the spies whom she was hiding. And she said this, Joshua 2, verses 8 through 11. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. And everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. And so what we see here is that somehow everybody in Jericho had heard about Israel and Israel's God and Rahab had come to be a believer. She says there at the end, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She had become a believer. And then Rahab made a special request of the spies in verse, verses 12 through 13. She says, now please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my father's family because I showed kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them, and save us from death. So Rahab is saying, I know you guys are about to invade. I know you're about to come. You're going to kill us all. I know God has given you all the land. But I want you all to promise me, since I've showed kindness to you, since I've protected you, that you'll protect me and my family. And so the spies gave Rahab their word. They would do that if she didn't turn them in. And so then Rahab let the spies down by a scarlet rope from her window because her house was built into the wall of the city. And so she helped them escape. And she even told them how to evade capture. It says in Joshua 2.16, Rahab told them, go to the hill country so that the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide there for three days until they return. Afterward, go on your way. So the spies then they gave Rahab one more word of instruction. Joshua 2, verses 17 through 20. They said, we will be free from this oath you made us swear, unless when we enter the land, you tie this scarlet cord to the window through which you let us down. Bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. If anyone goes out of the doors of your house, his death will be his own fault, and we will be innocent. But if anyone with you in the house should be harmed, his death will be our fault. And if you report our mission... We are free from this oath that you made us swear. So when the spies left, Rahab, she immediately took that red cord and she tied it to her window. What they're saying is that whenever we come and attack, we're going to be looking for this red cord. And if we see it, we're not going to attack your house. Or, and nobody in the house is going to get hurt. But if we don't see that red cord, then it's not our fault if y'all get hurt. So when the time came for the battle, of Jericho. Joshua was telling all the men, go get them. Joshua told them in verse 17 of chapter 6, Joshua 6, 17, Joshua said, but the city and everything in it are set apart to the Lord for destruction. Go in there and kill everybody. Only Rahab the prostitute and everyone with her in the house will live because she hid the messengers we sent. And then whenever the battle was going on, Joshua took those two spies and he sent them back into the city to rescue Rahab and her family. It says in verses 22 through 23 of Joshua 6, Joshua said, Go to the prostitute's house and bring the woman out of there, and all who are with her, just as you swore to her. So the young man who had scouted went in and brought out Rahab and her father, mother, brothers, and all who belonged to her. 
They brought out her whole family and settled them outside the camp of Israel. So what can we learn about faith from Rahab the prostitute? Let me give you four lessons about faith this morning. Four lessons about faith. The first lesson is by faith, anyone can be saved. By faith, anyone can be saved. So after the New Testament was written by, by the apostles, the first New Testament, or the, I'm sorry, the first Christian author was a man by the name of Clement of Rome. And he was a, one of the first pastors. He was a bishop or a pastor of the church in Rome. He was one of the first Christian authors, or the first Christian author after the New Testament. And he called Rahab a prophetess, a female prophet. He said, because when she used that red scarlet cord that, to rescue herself and those spies, that red scarlet cord foreshadowed the truth that anyone can be saved by putting their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, Rahab wasn't a very good person. She was a prostitute. And in fact, over the years, there have been some commentators that have tried to clean up her reputation. Josephus, you remember Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian? He said that Rahab was just an innkeeper. And then there was another uh, commentator, famous commentator named, named Rashi, who said that Rahab was just a seller of food. They tried to clean up her reputation, but when you look at the actual word used in the Hebrew Bible for prostitute, which is the word that's used to describe Rahab, it doesn't even use the word for a temple prostitute. That's a different word. The word for prostitute to describe Rahab is just a run-of-the-mill, ordinary, plain old, secular prostitute. She was a sinner. Not only that, but Rahab was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. And in fact, she was a part, Jericho was part of the Amorite kingdom. And that was a specific people group that God had set apart for destruction. He was planning on wiping them out. One commentator, Mark Dunn, he wrote this about Jericho. To give you a part, an idea of who, who Rahab was and the people that she was a part of, he says, Jericho was part of the Amorite kingdom, a grotesquely violent, totally depraved, thoroughly pagan culture, so hell-bent on the pursuit of everything evil that God himself had condemned them and ordered the Israelites to wipe them from the face of the earth. Rahab, therefore, epitomized the vileness of the Amorite culture at a point when they had collectively filled the measure of human wickedness to its very brim. She was a sinner. She was a part of a very sinful people. John MacArthur added this about the Amorites. He said, they were a debauched, idolatrous, and wicked people. They were noted for their grossly immoral and perverted sexual practices, as well as for their general cruelty. Among other things, they frequently put live babies in jars and built them into the city walls as foundation sacrifices. They were begging for judgment. This is who Rahab was. She was a prostitute in this city. She was a sinful person. She wasn't a Jew. And yet, while the rest of Rahab's neighbors perished in the war, Rahab was saved. Why? Because of faith. She had faith in the God of Israel. She believed the God of Israel was the true God, that, he was, that the being on his side was the right side of history. And so she chose to be on the side of the God of Israel. The gospel of Jesus Christ... The word gospel means good news. The reason why the gospel is such good news, one of the reasons, is because the Bible teaches that anyone can be saved from their sins by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, how many times you've done it, how far you've strayed from the Lord, what your background is, what your upbringing is. Anybody can be saved, can be forgiven of their sins and receive eternal life if you just put your faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That's the good news of Jesus Christ. God doesn't choose who to save based on how good you are, based on how many good deeds you've done. In fact, what the Bible says is that all of us are sinners. And so if God were to give us what we deserve, any of us, it would be hell. Now, some of us might deserve a hotter part of hell than others. That's certainly true. But all of us have fallen short of God's glorious standards. All of us are sinners. All of us, if, that's why you should never say, God, please be fair. 
Give me what I deserve. You never want God to give you what you deserve. It would be hell. He is so merciful and gracious. We just live in gratitude, constant gratitude for him not giving us what we deserve. And so that's what the Bible says. So that means salvation is a free gift. You don't deserve it and you cannot earn it because no matter how many things you do, you are still a sinner who deserves God's eternal wrath. And so the only way that God could save us is to send his son, Jesus Christ, to take our place on the cross to die for our sins. And the Bible says if we'll make a decision to turn from our sins and put our faith in Jesus, anybody can be saved. Several years ago, before a lot of you came to our church, our church did a car wash. And it was at the Checkers on the corner of Ambassador Caffrey and College Saloon. Is that Checkers still open? So that's where we did our car wash. And it, the idea, it was a totally free car wash. The idea was to teach the community or to announce to the community, we're Church Acadiana, we're here, and we're here to serve. We're not here to take anything. We just want to give you love in the name of Jesus. And so we had people standing on the side of the road with poster boards, just like you see today, free car wash, free car wash. So we had a lot of people come and get their cars washed. And it was amazing. These people tried to force donations on us. We told our volunteers, under no circumstances are you allowed to take donations. No matter what they say, do not take money from people. That's the whole idea of this. It's a free car wash. But people wanted to force their donations on them. I mean, they were upset about this idea of a free. They didn't understand the word free. Free means free. Salvation is a free gift. There's no way that you deserve it or can earn it. But a lot of people don't understand the word free. That's what it means that we are saved by grace through faith. The word grace means a gift. And a lot of people, no matter how many times you tell them that salvation is a free gift, you can't earn it, you don't deserve it, they still try to earn it. They try to work for it. And as long as you're trying to earn salvation, you can't receive it. As long as you think you deserve salvation, as long as you think you can possibly be good enough to get to heaven, you cannot be saved. You have to get to the point where you realize, I'm a sinner like Rahab. I may not be a prostitute, but I'm just as bad. I am a sinner deserving God's wrath. The only hope for me is that salvation is a free gift given to us through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins, and all I have to do is make a decision to turn from my sins and put my faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is a free gift. That's the first thing we learn by faith. Anybody can be saved. Here's the second lesson we learn from, from Rahab's faith. Authentic faith is proven by works. Authentic faith is proven by works. It's interesting, the Apostle James, who was actually Jesus' brother, he wrote the book of James in the New Testament. And in the book of James, James mentions Rahab. And he uses Rahab as an illustration of the truth that authentic faith is proven by your actions. Authentic faith. If you've got truth, you know, the Bible says to be saved, you need to put your faith in Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus. Well, James says, well, how do you know if you have the right kind of faith? He says the right kind of faith always results in works, in actions. Look what he says. In fact, he uses two illustrations uh, to, to illustrate this truth. The first, he, he points to the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. How do we know that Abraham had faith? Well, look what he did. He was willing to sacrifice his son for God. And then he also points to the story of Rahab rescuing the spies. Those are the two illustrations he uses to point to this truth that authentic faith is proven by works. He says it in James 2, 25 through 26. He says, in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now, James isn't saying that we're saved by works. He's saying that if you've truly got faith, it will result in works. We're saved by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. Faith is never lonely. Always accompanying faith are works of righteousness and love and obedience. Vance Havner said this. He says, what I do today, what I do today is what I really believe. Everything else 
is just religious talk. So you can say you believe in Jesus. You can say that you believe in God. You can say that you're a Christian. You can say that you love the Lord. But what, what really proves whether or not you're a Christian, whether or not you have true faith in Jesus, is your behavior. It's your works. It's your actions. That's where the proof is. And so the author of Hebrews, he's writing about faith in Hebrews 11. He's trying to teach us about faith. And he points to Rahab as an example of faith. Well, how do we know that Rahab had faith? We can't actually look in her mind. We can't look in her heart. How do we know that she had faith? Well, the author of Hebrews points to her actions, points to her behavior. That's how we know that a person's faith is genuine. You can say that you're a Christian, but are you acting like it? Do you love the Lord? I'm not saying you're perfect, but do you love the Lord? Do you want to please the Lord? Does it, does it burn you up and hurt you on the inside whenever you fail the Lord? Are you striving to grow spiritually? These are the marks of true faith. When you become a Christian, right when you become a Christian, you receive eternal life. Eternal life is not something you get whenever you die. It's something you get right when you become a Christian. And you, you receive this eternal life, and God changes you immediately. He changes your want to. Now you want to please God. And he gives you the desire and the power to please God. Not perfectly, but you'll start trending in a direction. And if you don't have that, if you haven't experienced that transformation in your life, then I question your salvation. You've got head belief, but not heart belief. It hasn't affected your life. But what we learn from Rahab is that authentic faith is proven by your works. Here's the problem. There's a lot of people... They go to church, they think they're saved, but they're not. It's a real problem. And we know they're not because of their behavior. Uh, I heard a story recently about a youth pastor who went to serve. He was called to serve as a youth pastor at a church in Arlington. And he came from one of the largest churches in Tennessee. And he went to Arlington, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He went to Arlington because he wanted to into the Ph.D. program at Southwestern Seminary, where I went to seminary. And this young man, he was very articulate, very intelligent, handsome, athletic, musical. I mean, just he had all the gifts. And he and the pastor became close, close friends. They golfed together. They played tennis together. And there was something, though, the pastor said, there was something about this young man's spirit that just wasn't right. But he couldn't put his finger on it. Until one day, somebody came to the pastor and said, the youth pastor is leaving his wife for a married seminary student. The pastor couldn't believe his ears, and so immediately he had that youth pastor in his office to talk it over. And so he talked to the youth pastor, and he said, is this true? The youth pastor said, yes. The pastor said, have you slept with her? The youth pastor said, not yet pastor said, don't you realize this is a grave sin against God? The youth pastor said, God will forgive us. I don't know that man's heart. I don't know if he's truly saved, but those aren't the words. That's not the attitude of a true Christian, of somebody that's been saved. That's somebody who knew Jesus up here, who believed in Jesus but it wasn't coming out in his actions. And the scary thing is, he was a youth pastor, a minister in the church. He knew all the right things to believe. But I don't think he was really saved because it wasn't coming out in his behavior. It's my prayer that we don't have anybody in our church who's deceived, who thinks they're going to heaven, but they're not. True faith is proven by your works. Here's the third lesson that we learned from Rahab about faith. Faith takes great risks for God. Faith takes great risks for God. Try to recall with me just for a moment what happened to Rahab or what she did. Her act of faith. She had these spies who came to her house and she hid them from the authorities knowing that if they search thoroughly, they're going to find the spies and then they're going to kill me and my family. And yet she took a great risk. Why? It's because she had faith in the God of Israel. 
She knew that this was the real God. And the only way long-term, for the long-term survival of her and her family was to align themselves with the God of Israel. And so that's what she did. did. True faith takes great risks for God. It always does. If you've got faith, you will take risks for God. John Piper, he wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Life, and he talked about risk in one of the chapters. Here's a couple of quotes from that book. First of all, he defines risk. He says, I define risk very simply as an action that exposes you to the possibility of loss or injury. If you take a risk, you can lose money, you can lose face, you can lose your health or even your life. And what's worse, if you take a risk, you may endanger other people and not just yourself. And then he asks, why is there such a thing as risk? He says, risk is possible because we don't know how things will turn out. For that reason, risk is inevitable for people of faith. If you've got faith, you will be risking quite often because when you obey God, you don't know how it's going to turn out. When you go and witness to someone or invite somebody to church, put yourself out there, you don't know how it's going to turn out. When you attempt to do something for God, when you attempt to serve God in some way, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so if you're a person of faith, you're going to constantly be taking risks for God. When Lydia and I started Church Cadiana, when we started this church, we took a great risk. We were in just finishing seminary, and we wanted to go start a church in Lafayette. So we moved to Lafayette. We had a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and one in the oven. And I didn't know how I was going to provide for the family. We didn't know where we were going to live. Uh, we didn't know how to, I didn't know how to pastor a church. I was never a pastor before. I was a youth pastor. I was never a pastor before. We didn't know how we were going to reach people. We didn't know where the church was going to meet. We didn't know anything. But we took a great risk. Why? Because we had faith. That's what faith does. You take risks. We had faith in several things. We had faith that God would catch us if we fell. You have to believe that. All things work together for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We had faith that God would catch us. We also had faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the gospel changes lives, that it changed our lives. We had faith that the people of Acadiana were going to hell without Jesus Christ. We had faith that the best way to reach people for Christ is to start a new church. And so for all those reasons and more, all those, we had faith, and so we took a great risk for God. When you have faith, you, you'll take risks. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you hesitating to obey in some way because it's too risky? In other words, is there something that you, are you, are, are you holding on to some sin, or is there something you're supposed to be doing? You know God wants you to do it, but you're hesitating to obey because it's too risky. Here's another question. Are you hesitating to do something for God? In other words, there's a way that you want to serve him. There's some, something you want to do for the Lord, but you're hesitating because it's too risky. If that's why you're hesitating, if, if you'll only obey the Lord or do something for God when it's not risky, you will not live the life of faith. You won't progress in your faith. You won't grow in the Lord because as a, as a Christian, you're going to constantly be taking risks. That's what the life of faith is about. Look at this quote by author Erwin McManus. He's a pastor in Los Angeles, a good pastor. He says, he says this, Somewhere along the way, the movement of Jesus Christ became civilized Christianity. We created a religion using the name of Jesus Christ and convinced ourselves that God's optimal desire for our lives was to insulate us in a spiritual bubble where we risk nothing, sacrifice nothing, lose nothing, worry about nothing. But God's will for us is less about our comfort than it is about our contribution. God would never choose for us safety at the cost of significance. God created you so that your life would count, not so that you count the days of your life. If you're going to live a life of faith, you have to be willing to take risks for God. Now, somebody might say, well, it's easy for you to say Rahab's risk paid off. I mean, she risked everything for her family, but 
She got lucky. You know, it paid off for her. But sometimes faith doesn't pay off. That's not true. The life of faith always pays off. Any act of obedience, any risk you take for the Lord, it always pays off. If not in this life, then in the next life. Because God is always watching what we do. And he records every single thing that we do in his books. And he will reward you any time you take a risk of faith. It will pay off a hundredfold. I guarantee that. But if you don't take a great risk for God, you'll lose the reward. And then you'll live with regret. And you'll always wonder, what if? What might have been if I had just trusted the Lord and took that risk of faith for him? There's something else I didn't tell you about Rahab. The New Testament mentions her weirdly in the genealogy of Jesus. If you go to Matthew, look at this verse, Matthew 1.5. The genealogy of Jesus, that lists Christ's ancestors. And look what it says, Matthew 1.5. It says, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. You remember who Boaz was, right? He's the one who married Ruth. He was the kinsman redeemer. So Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. In other words, Rahab eventually, she was saved by the Jews, and she eventually became a Jew. She converted to Judaism. She married a Jew. They had little Jewish babies. And one of her ancestors was King David. And then one of King David's uh, uh, descendants, I should say, one of her descendants was King David. One of King David's descendants was Jesus. Rahab got to become one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. That would have never happened had she not taken a risk of faith. Who knows what you're missing because you're hesitating because of the risk. Faith takes great risks for God. Here's one more lesson we can learn from Rahab's faith. Faith is uncommon. Faith is uncommon. If we go back to the verse in Hebrews, it's just one verse, Hebrews 11, verse 31, just one verse where Rahab's story is mentioned, where it says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace, and notice this last part, it says, and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. What is that talking about? Well, Rahab lived in the city of Jericho, which had thousands and thousands of inhabitants. And yet, Rahab was the only one who put her faith in the God of Israel. They had all heard about Israel. They all heard the stories of what Israel had done to the other Amorite kings. They had all heard about what happened with the Red Sea. But Rahab was the only one who had faith. And that points to the truth that faith is uncommon. Don't be surprised if you have faith. If you're a person of faith, a man, a woman of faith, don't be surprised if you're not surrounded by another, a bunch of like-minded people. Don't be surprised if at times you're standing alone. Don't be surprised if at times you're the oddball. Because faith is uncommon. It always has been, always will be. Real faith is uncommon. You know, nobody likes to be odd. Nobody likes to be weird. We all like to fit in. We just do. I remember years ago, whenever the Yeti cups came out. You remember the Yeti cups? How many of you have a Yeti cup? Come on, don't be embarrassed. I know it's embarrassing, but, but raise your hand. All right, some of you shy. So when these came out, do you remember how hot these were of an item? I mean, they spread like wildfire. Everybody had to have a Yeti cup. And when you, saw, when you went to the gym or when you went to work or to school and you saw everybody was carrying these weird metal cups around, you thought, I've got to get one of those. I'm the weirdo. I'm the oddball. And so what'd you do? You ran and you got you a Yeti cup. We don't like to be different. We don't like to stand out. And then something crazy happened.
the Stanley Cups came out. Now, let's see how honest you are. Raise your hand if you have a Stanley Cup. All right, just Eddie. No, there's a bunch of liars in here because <laughs> this is Lydia's cup, and she didn't raise her hand. She went like this. <laughs> the Stanley Cups came out, and these things are hotter than these things. Everybody started getting the Stanley Cup, and so you didn't want to be caught dead at the gym without your Stanley Cup, or else you'd be really, really weird. You're the oddball. It just illustrates the truth that we all want to fit in. None of us wants to be weird. But if you're going to live the life of faith, you've got to be willing to walk around with one of these when everybody else has one of these because faith is uncommon. You know, I, this was really inspiring to me. You guys are familiar with the Black Lives Matter movement. And, I mean, if you're not, we can talk later. I'm not going to explain it right now. But at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement a few years ago, if you remember, professional sports adopted it. I mean, they adopted it completely. And they decided, we're going to just stand for this, or I should say kneel for this movement. And so, for example, in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, all the teams during the warm-ups, they were wearing Black Lives Matter T-shirts. I mean, the coaches, the players, and they were all kneeling during the national anthem. Do you remember this? Professional football, professional... A lot of people stopped watching sports because of this. It was so crazy. But there was one young man. You can see him there standing up. His name is Jonathan Isaac. He's black, by the way, if you couldn't see. <laughs> He's a strong Christian. You got to look him up. Awesome young man. And he didn't think that the Black Lives Matter movement was in line with Scripture. And so he said, I'm not going to kneel during the national anthem. I'm not going to wear the T-shirt. But notice, he's the only one. He's the only one. If you're going to live the life of faith, you've got to be willing to be the only one. You've got to be willing at times to stand alone because faith, true faith, really is uncommon. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of other players in the NBA who didn't really support the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of them just didn't think, they didn't care about it. But they wore the T-shirt and they knelt because they didn't want to make waves. Nobody wants to make waves. As a Christian, you've got to be willing to make waves. True faith is uncommon. So, we're learning about faith from a prostitute. You can learn something from anyone. That means you might be able to learn something from me this morning. Let me ask you a question. Think about Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute, and yet God saved her. Now, even though she was a sinner, and not only that, but she went on to become one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. God can take any person, no matter who you are, what you've done, and save you and do a great thing with your life. But you have to make the decision. I'm going to turn from my sins, and I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ from this day forward. If you'll do that, you can be saved right now and receive eternal life right now. God will forgive you and give you eternal life, the guarantee of heaven when you die, and he'll change your life right now, but you've got to decide, I want to turn from my sins and put my faith in Jesus. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for Rahab and for using her to teach us about faith. That the reality, Lord, that anybody can be saved, anybody can be saved by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Father, if there's somebody here this morning that needs to take a great risk of obedience, that, that, that needs to do something for God, that needs to serve you in some way, but they've been hesitant, Lord, we pray that you would help them to take those moves. Give them the faith, Lord. If there's somebody here this morning that's not saved, we pray for their salvation. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me talk to you just for a moment about salvation. Let me ask you a question. 
with your head bowed, your eyes closed, think about this. Are you sure that you're saved? Are you sure? You say, well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, we are, well, we already talked about that, that true faith comes out in your works. Are you sure that you're saved? If you died today, are you sure you'd go to heaven? God loves you so much, despite what you've done, and he wants to save you. He wants to save everybody in this room. He wants you to go to heaven. God is not willing that any should perish. He loves you. He's got an amazing plan for your life. But you have to make the decision to hand over the steering wheel of your life to Jesus and to ask him to come in your life and to save you. If you would do that right now, God will save you and he will transform your life. You just got to take a risk. And God will catch you, I guarantee it. He will catch you. So if you're here this morning and you're not sure that you're saved, and if you'd like to be saved right now, through and through, totally transformed, totally washed and made new, if you'd like that this morning, I want you pray this prayer after me. Pray it silently. But repeat after me in your heart. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I need your salvation. I need a Savior. Please come into my life and save me. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again. I believe you can give me eternal life. I believe you can transform my life. Do that in my life right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray for you if you're making that decision this morning. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you to the front. But with everybody's head bowed, eyes closed, when I count to three, if you just prayed to receive Jesus into your life, if you just prayed to be saved, when I count to three, you just lift up your hand so I can see it and pray for you. One, two, three. Amen. You can put your hands down. I see six hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us together this morning to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we all agree and admit we need Jesus. We all together cry out mercy. Have mercy on us through Jesus. We thank you so much for Christ and for the cross and for the salvation that you give us. God, we pray that you would do an amazing work in the lives of these people who have raised their hands this morning. Even those who, who didn't raise their hands, but they are asking Jesus to come into their lives and to save them. We pray, Father, that you do a mighty work. Help them to take one step of faith, one step of obedience at a time. Help them to grow. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.